Yes, exactly right. I think this was a remarkable year because we saw uh, those the big name autocrats hitting not just a point of resistance, but perhaps reaching a limit of how far they can extend their autocrat autocratic mechanisms. The most obvious and glaring and continuing is the case of Vladimir Putin simultaneously invading Ukraine and launching a further domestic clampdown on opposition, freedom of speech, civil liberties within Russia. Uh, he's obviously taken a huge uh, punch in the nose and he's on the losing side at the moment. Uh, that hasn't prevented him continuing the crackdown at home, but it has pointed to the limits, um, or certainly at least a, a very serious point of resistance against him, his project, and his international aggression and expansionism. And in the same year, we've seen Xi Jinping, leader of the other uh, great autocracy, if an autocracy can be great, how about we just call it big autocracy, um, China, who has also reached a point of, of at the very least, resistance, uh, which he struck uh, very suddenly and to which he's responded very suddenly. When protesters started taking to the streets in dozens of Chinese cities, he eased the COVID zero lockdowns that had gripped China for nearly three years, and he eased them very quickly and very decisively. Again, that seems to suggest a limit uh, to how much the people were put up with and how much uh, power and uh, autocracy he can exert and get away with. But it, 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 Xi Jinping's back down was so surprising. He had secured that all important third term that meant so much to him. Um, do you think we could see in China further resistance towards his rule and the very tight constraints that he has now put China under? Uh, yes, I do, Bev. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's fascinating, isn't it, that just at the moment he broke, he rewrote the constitution and broke the long-standing rule, internally imposed rule on the Chinese Communist Party to have at most two five-year terms, broke that and gave himself a third one. Uh, at the peak moment of hubris, he was then visited within days by nemesis, something the ancient Greeks uh, knew would, was inevitable. Um, and I think, yes, I think those protests have just given us a glimpse of, um, you know, it's like the, the lid comes off just a tiny bit and uh, all of this steaming energy comes surging out. Uh, and rather than try to put the lid back down, he's eased the lid back a fraction. Now, that's just given us a glimpse um, of what we hadn't been able to see, which was the seething discontent just barely contained within China. Now, uh, if that was already there, he's, and he's eased some of the pressure by backing off on some of the COVID constraints, we know that other sources of frustration in that country, in that system, persist. Most notably is the state of the economy, which, is, which remains at uh, recession levels of growth for a developing economy, which is 2 to 3%. Fine for a country like ours, but in China, that's a recession that feels like a recession, and a collapse in the property market, and a collapse, therefore, in the aspirations and wealth building of China's middle class. So that persists and they haven't found solutions to those yet. Um, and other sources, Chinese uh, youth unemployment's gone 12 to 25% in the last two years, uh, producing a lot of unrest on campus, which was one of the main areas of energy and, and discontent we saw in those protests just the other day. So yes, I do think to answer your question uh, that the Chinese public has other sources of frustration. There may well be other outbreaks, but rest assured that, that that's occupying the mind of Xi Jinping every day, every night. And a final uh, observation is that um, I've, I've heard one academic describe China not as a democracy or an autocracy, but as a respondocracy, meaning that uh, the Chinese Communist Party keep, keeps a very close eye, constantly monitoring public opinion, and where possible, moving uh, to assuage local causes of concern or to head off sources of discontent before they can uh, boil over. You can be sure that the respondocracy is fully primed and working overtime at the moment. Interesting. Iran is an interesting case, though, absolutely running into enormous resistance, resistance that doesn't seem to want to go, won't go away, even as they are executing protesters in public. Um, how long can that movement continue? What can the Iranian regime actually give? 
Well, the regime has uh, backed off on the enforcement of the hijab uh, law requiring that women be covered um, whenever they appear in public. They've really relented on that. Now, it's not clear whether that's a permanent or temporary relaxation, but th they've certainly made that concession. It has yet to take the heat out of the protest. The, the protests have uh, slowed down a bit, but they're continuing. And I mean, the Iranian people showing incredible bravery in the face of murderous repression. The same thing in China and in Russia. We are seeing incredible displays of human courage and human the human struggle for liberty. Uh, to answer your question, in Iran, uh, there are persistent rumours that the supreme leader Khamenei is on his deathbed or close to it. Now, uh, if that's if that's true, there there could be major upheaval ahead in the event that well he'll die one day. The question is when and under what circumstances, and then what public and re regime reaction is to follow, because that will open up uh, a whole new uh, series of changes and opportunities for people seeking change mm -hmm. in Iran. Peter, in our region, um, much seems to be shifting, particularly a very renewed purpose around multilateral relationships that President Biden has given um, and has come into strengthen relations with Australia, with Japan, with India even. How critical is that going to be going forward, given, you know, these behemoths in the region like China? Well, it's critical uh, for liberty to persist in the Indo-Pacific, uh, because if, unless countries balance, unless they band together to balance against China's power, uh, China will continue to expand both its influence and its ter territory inexor inexorably. That's the plan, and that's what they've been successfully doing. Because China's power has become so preponderant, especially close to its own uh, borders, uh, and there's uh, border skirmishes underway again between China and India, um, it's become obvious that no one country, not even the US uh, by itself, can resist or repel China's expansionism. So that's why countries banding together and the, the forerunner and, and most often cited example of that, of course, is the Quad, which brings together the US, Japan, India and Australia. These countries are beginning, you see the nascent movement of them gathering, <clears throat> excuse me, in new groupings to balance against China. It's the only hope for restraining China's ambitions in the Indo-Pacific. Mm. What was interesting too, you know, in terms of a, a shift in the US, obviously was the midterms where unexpectedly um, the Republic, uh, the, the Democrats won an additional seat in the Senate even though they lost the House. A lot of Trump's candidates hand-picked were beaten. Is this the beginning of the end of Trump's dominance, do you think? Is he on the wane or is, would that be a mistake? Yes, the conduct of the midterm elections does seem to be an indicator pointing in that direction that uh, Trump has lost and is losing traction with the defeat of all the candidates who are anti-constitution, um, bar one. But we haven't seen, even if Trump himself is losing relevance and losing traction, we haven't seen yet the end of uh, the sort of right-wing populism and post-truth movement which produced so much uh, dislocation and polarization in American politics. So I would say it's very early. The signs uh, on Trump suggest that he's running out of puff, but that larger roiling and long running series of forces liberated by the combination of extreme inequality, uh, great po political polarization, and now all, all of the sort of fermenting groups um, of right wing nutters uh, militias and extremists, that lives on and we've yet to see uh, what shape that takes in the years ahead. Yeah. It is uh, the end of the year is drawing to a close. Um, we just love the conversations we have with you and your unique insights. Have a wonderful break and we look forward to doing it all again next year. Thanks, Peter. It's always a pleasure talking to you, Bev. Have a lovely Christmas. Likewise.